Hello and welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. I'm Kyle Pettit, sitting here with TA, who just preached a message uh, called The Devil Wears Deception. We have a few questions that we're going to answer, uh, but before that, let's listen to TA preach that message now. Well, howdy! Hey, uh, good morning, Faith Bridge. I hope that all is well. Uh, my name is Timothy Atik. I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. It's great to be back with you for a second week in a row. I want to start by just sharing with you, any time that I speak at Faith Bridge, I usually just sleep at my house in College Station, and I wake up and, and leave my house at about 6.40 in the morning, which puts me here in plenty of time to get ready uh, to, to be with you all. Uh, but I will never forget uh, driving to Faith Ridge back in April. I got up and I left my house at about 6.40 and I was making my way down Highway 6 and I found myself between uh, Navasota and the 290 turnoff. And it was just pitch black outside. I mean, it was, there was no one out on the road. No one was dumb enough to plan to be on the road at 6.40 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Everyone plans better than I do. And so it was just pitch black, no one around. And so that's a really nice moment. It usually takes me a little to wake up on my Sunday drives to Faith Bridge. And so it's nice to just have a little bit of runway to wake up. So I was just enjoying the quietness of the morning. And as I found myself between Navasota and 290, I got this emergency iPhone alert. And here's what it said. In the pitch blackness of the morning, it said this. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, tornado warning in this area till 7.30 a.m. Take shelter now. I mean, what do you do with that? I'm like, I'm in my 2015 Hyundai Sonata. I don't know if I got the tornado package on this car. (laughs) Like, that's all the shelter I have at this moment. And I'm telling you, that was a moment, all right? Normally, it takes me a little bit of time to wake up. I was alert. And I didn't blink for probably three minutes because uh, in the, as I looked, I began, my eyes were glued to the window because I was like, where is the thing that's trying to end me? All right, where is it? It's out there. I just can't see it. And in that moment, it was a very sobering moment knowing that there is something out there that is bent on destruction. Even though I can't see it, it's out there. And so I need to do something about this. And and at least for those next few minutes, all I could think is, what do I need to do to live? And the reason I tell you that is because last week we... We're in this two-week series that we're kind of calling The Devil Wears. And the reason that I tell you that story is because of what uh, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5.8. He says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What you have to realize is just like I sat there in my car and had this realization that out in the darkness there is a force that is bent on destruction. What we have to realize is that there is a force of darkness at play in this world and his bent is towards destruction. His aim in our lives is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so what I'm trying to call you to do, my hope is that in some ways this morning is an emergency alert from God through me to you saying, wake up, sober up, glue your eyes to the windows of your life and look for the movement of the evil one who is at work. What you have to realize is every single day when you wake up, when you put your feet on the floor, you're not just stepping into your bedroom, you are stepping onto a battlefield with a real enemy that hates you. And you know what our tendency is? Our tendency is to buy into this mentality of, if I can't see it, it's not real. 
And that's like me sitting in my car saying, just because I, I can't see the tornado, then that means the tornado is not real. How idiotic would that be? Just because you can't see your enemy doesn't mean that you don't have one. And Peter tells us, be sober-minded. What's he saying? Wake up and prepare yourself for battle every single day. What you need to understand is that your enemy has several different, different tactics that he will employ to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. Last week, we talked about the tactic of unforgiveness. We talked about the fact that the devil wears unforgiveness. And one of the greatest ways that he steals our joy is by, by telling us that unforgiveness is a viable option in life. And today, we're just gonna talk about how the devil wears deception. John tells us in John 8, 44, he refers to Satan or the devil as the father of lies. That's one of the titles that's given to our enemy, that he is the father of lies. What that means is his main mode of operation is to lie. And the reason that our enemy can be so effective in our lives is that he will speak lies to us and we will believe them. And you know what the crazy thing is? I'm going to show you this morning. The devil has been running with the same lies since the beginning of time. He's so unoriginal, like he started with a few lies and he's never changed, but he hasn't needed to change because all of humanity just keep buying into the same lies. And so here's what I'm doing. I'm calling the people here at Faithbridge. I'm just calling us to take heed, to open our eyes, for us to be sober-minded, to wake up and to step onto the battlefield because when we prepare ourselves for battle, victory is not just possible, it is promised through our Savior Jesus Christ. And so this morning, what I wanna do is I wanna unpack for you the three lies that we tend to believe the most, and I'm gonna do it by just uh, unpacking for you Genesis chapter three, which which is the fall of mankind, but it's really the first place in the scriptures where we see our enemy, the devil, show up. So if you have a Bible, turn with me uh, this morning to Genesis chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, some of our ushers will be distributing them now, and we'd love for you to take one and follow along with us. Genesis chapter three. And let me just read you this interaction that will be familiar for many people in the room, but I'm gonna call you to see it as if you're seeing it for the first time. Uh, I wanna unpack for you the interaction between our enemy, the devil, and the first human beings, Adam and Eve. It says this in Genesis chapter three, verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so all eyes on me, the reason that this passage is so applicable is because in this passage we find really the three greatest lies that our enemy started with at the beginning of the world and he's still employing to this day. And these three lies are the three greatest lies that promote destruction in our lives. These are the lies that our enemy uses to steal, kill, and destroy. The first lie that our enemy speaks into our lives is this. God is really not that good. 
That's the first lie. God is really not that good. Look again. Look back at verse 1. It says that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And here's what he said to the woman. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Here's where uh, Satan is simply sowing seeds of doubt with the woman. He's not asking Eve a question. He's not wondering. He's not, did God really say that? He's not asking a question. This is actually a, a statement of shock and surprise. He's actually mocking God, saying, how ridiculous, how dramatic, how idiotic does God have to be to tell you that you can't eat from this tree? You know what he's doing? He's trying to sow seeds of doubt. And I don't know if you noticed it, but what he's doing is he is, he is focusing Eve in on the prohibition, and he's trying to take her eyes off of God's provision. And you know what happens? It actually works. As Satan tries to paint God up as a God who is restrictive and repressive instead of good and generous, Eve begins to take the bait. And so how does she respond? In verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden. But God said, this is Eve's understanding of what God said. God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Is that what God had said? It's not. Eve had already misunderstood what God had said. Let me read you what God actually said. We find it in Genesis chapter two, verses 16 and 17. Here's what God actually said. He said, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Do you see that? Like God isn't restrictive, he's generous. He's saying you may eat of any tree in the garden, but, but Eve's, Eve's eyes are now off of the pro provision and her eyes are now on the prohibition. And what she's saying is, or she's lost sight of the generosity and the goodness of God when God says you can eat of any tree in the garden except for one and not just that. God says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you, will sh you shall surely die. Did God mention anything about not touching the fruit? No. But what do you see? You see that God's provision has been reduced and God's prohibition has been expanded. And the result is that Eve had begun to believe that God isn't that good. And now what does Satan do? He begins to water the seeds of doubt. Listen to what he says in verse four. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He just straight up lies to her now. He's like, you will not surely die. God is actually the one lying to you. He's telling you that you're gonna die. You're not gonna die. It's actually going to be the opposite. If you eat this fruit, you're actually going to be like God. See, Eve, what you need to understand is God's actually trying to rip you off. He's trying to steal from you. He's trying to hold you back from having everything that you can have and from being everything that you can be. You can actually be like God. And so now, the seeds that have been planted and then watered begin to sprout. Verse six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That interesting, all it took was a conversation with the devil for Eve to begin to look at the tree as something to be desired instead of avoided. And so what does she do? She eats of it, and then she shares it. 
Why? Because she believed the lie that God is really not that good. I just want you to think, how is this lie possibly at play in your lives? You might not even realize it. But see, you have to understand your view of God is gonna determine your response to God. And a lot of the reason that you are operating with, you, the reason that you have a small response to God right now, maybe you're not that interested him, in him, you're not as committed to him, you're not listening to him as much, the reason that you have a small response to God is you have a small view of God. And the reason you have a small view of God is that you have begun to believe that God just isn't that good. How does it play out in your life? Think about what we talked about last week with God, with unforgiveness. Did God really say to not hold on to anger? I mean, that's your right. Anger, bitterness, and resentment, that's your right. Don't relinquish that because if you do that, you're actually telling the person who has hurt you that they won. Did God really say that? If you're single in here, did God really say don't have sex before marriage? Who is he to say that? Does he even understand 2018? How irrelevant is God? What does the world say? If it feels good now, you should do it now. Why wouldn't you do it now? Did God really say, do not look lustfully at a woman? What do you think pornography is for? Especially if your needs aren't being met in some other way, you can escape to fantasy worlds on the internet and you know what, it doesn't hurt anyone. That's your right. Did God really say don't gossip? What? How else are we going to spread information to each other? What else are we going to talk about when we're together at lunch? (laughs) Gossip isn't hurtful. It's actually helpful. It's informative. (laughs) Did God really say that? Did God really say to manage your money in a wise way? Does he, really not wanting, does he really not want you to spend money you don't have? He doesn't understand the concept of credit. That's the beauty of it. You can be a $30,000 millionaire. You can get whatever you want, whenever you want, and you don't even have to have the money to do it. Has God really said? And so, what happens is we end up subtly. We wouldn't sit there and outright say, God is not good. No, we just function as if he's not. And so I just, you know, I think about my kids and there are times where my kids have not seen me as a good father. I think about when we lived in Waco several years ago, my sons, Noah and Andrew, they were three and one and we lived on a busy street where cars would fly by at 40, 50 miles an hour. And so I walked my kids out. We had a long driveway where they wanted to go out and run around and ride their bikes around. And, and I pointed to a line on the cement. I said, you cannot go past this line because there are heavy pieces of machinery flying by at 50 miles an hour. Now, who in here is sitting there saying, what a, what a restrictive dad. <laughs> how repressive, like how hard it must have been to live with you. <laughs> what right do you have to tell your kids where they can and cannot play? If they wanna go play chicken with large pieces of machinery, they should be able to do that. It's their life, let them live it. Or like my son Noah, when he was little, like if he had his way, his diet would have consisted solely of bananas and cheese. (laughs) Can you imagine how constipated he would have been? (laughs) I'm telling you, if we had only let him eat bananas and cheese. And so I said, dude, That's fine that you like those things, but you're gonna have to touch some of the other food groups. We're gonna have to get some fiber rolling through you because we need to keep things moving along. (laughs) Anyone here say that? Look at that and be like, how dare you? If he wants to have a colon that is a brick, let him have it. (laughs) 
I'm sorry, let's pray and get out of here. <laughs> you know what the problem was with my kids? Is that their perspective was limited and they couldn't see fully that I wasn't trying to rip them off, I was trying to actually set them free. Do you realize that sometimes you just don't have the perspective to be able to see that your father isn't out to rip you off, he's trying to set you free. Have you ever stopped and asked the question why? Like God, why would you give me that command? Like have you ever just stopped before you, before you completely disregarded it or completely assumed that God is out of touch or irrelevant or out to steal from you, have you ever just paused and thought, okay, God, why would you ask me not to do that? What if God's not trying to rip you off? What if he's trying to set you free from guilt, shame, and regret? The first lie that we tend to believe is that God is not that good. You know what's interesting? Just to finish up that point, when you look in Genesis one and two, specifically chapter two, there's really only two commands that God gives Adam and Eve. What are they? Be fruitful and multiply. Make babies, that's a great command. Enjoy one another. And what's the second one? Eat of any tree you want except one. See, God's will wasn't the needle in the haystack, it was the hay in the haystack. Because God is very good. The second lie that the evil one consistently speaks to us and we believe is you don't need God because you can be God. You don't need God because you can be God. You know what the interesting thing is? is that everything that Adam and Eve got to experience was a gift from God. Like the breath in their lungs, the text says that God himself breathed it into their nostrils. Their oxygen was a gift. Their relationship, the fact that they were naked and not ashamed, the fact that they, had, they were the first married couple who officiated their wedding, God did. Imagine that, talk about one-upping one in conversation. Hey, who officiated your wedding? Think that guy, TJ, it's TA, by the way. That's what people call me. <laughs> who officiated your wedding? Um, God, okay, that's better. <laughs> he put them in paradise. He gave them the authority to name the animals. Everything they experienced was a gift. And yet Satan shows up and says, you don't need God. You can be God. You remember what he told him in verse five? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the lie. You don't need God because you can be God. And watch how Eve responds. This is really interesting. It says in verse six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, here's why that's important. Up until this point in the entire Bible, God was the one who had been determining what was good. If you look at the rhythm of creation, God creates, he steps back, he looks at what is created, and then he declares that it is good. That happens five or six times in Genesis chapter one, where God looks and determines or declares what is good. Now, Eve takes it upon herself to determine what is good. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, look at what she does. She took of its fruit, that Hebrew word that's been translated took. It's the same Hebrew word that's used when it says that God took Adam and placed him in the garden or God took a rib from Adam and fashioned it into Eve. Now Eve is taking as God took. She took of its fruit and ate. 
And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now watch this, verse seven. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Up until this point, God had provided them with everything that they needed. And now what do we see Adam and Eve doing? We see them trying to provide for themselves, trying to make clothing for themselves. We see them believing the lie that they don't need God because they can be God. I want you to just think about these two, these first two lies that we're talking about. That God isn't that good. That you don't need God because you can be God. Here's what I want you to understand. Um, Our enemy is completely fine with you believing in God. Like his ultimate goal isn't for you to be an atheist or an agnostic. Do you realize that? His ultimate goal is not for you to, to disbelieve. He is completely fine with you being a religious person as long as he can get you to believe that God is not good and that God isn't needed, he's won. Like if he can get you to come into this place on Sundays half-hearted, uninterested, and unfocused, he is successful. All he needs you to believe is you just get your shot of religion, you check a box, and then you go out and you live as if God isn't real. I just want you to think about this. How is this second lie that you don't need God because you can be God, how is this at play in your life? And you're gonna have to think for a second because nobody in here, and if you are, then you're probably in the minority, but not many people are going around saying, "Uh, you wanna know what God I worship? It's me, I worship myself because I'm God. No one really says that or believes that, but let me ask you this. Does anyone in here feel too busy for God right now? Like you're just, you're, you're just too busy for God. It's like it'd be nice to have time to read my Bible or have time to pray or have time to, but I'm just too busy for God right now. Do you want to know why you're too busy for God? You're too busy for God because you're too busy trying to be God. See, God is an obligation for you instead of a source of life. Anyone in here in a constant state of stress? Like you wear anxiety around like a badge of honor? Like stress is your anthem? People are like, hey, how are things going? I'm just so, I'm so busy right now. I've gotten like negative 30 minutes of sleep this week. That's how college students are. are. It's like, hey, what's going on? I'm just so busy. I'm like, that's not noble. I don't hear that and think, you must be a really amazing person. I wish my life was out of balance like your life was. (laughs) No, there's, there's nothing noble about consistent stress and anxiety. But do you wanna know why? You're consistently stressed, and let me just say, I understand that there are, there are some medical conditions where people struggle with anxiety. I'm one of those people, and so I get that. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, I'm talking about choosing to shoulder your life. And you don't need God, you don't need his shoulders because you believe that your shoulders will be strong enough for your life. Let me just tell you, they won't be. They won't be. God's the one who made you and he made you to need him. And so he will consistently put you in situations you cannot control. And that's where stress arises because you're turning inward instead of upward. Anyone here right now just doing what feels right? I think about Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 where he says, I never said no to myself. Anyone in that place where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna eat what I wanna eat. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I'm gonna buy what I wanna buy. I'm gonna go where I wanna go. I'm gonna sleep with who I wanna sleep with. I'm gonna drink what I wanna drink. I'm gonna work when I wanna work, and when I don't wanna work, I'm not gonna work. I'm gonna do what I want to do. This is my life. I'm in control. I will have it my way. Anyone there right now? This is, 
This is how our enemy is effective, is he gets us to buy the lie. You don't need God because you can be God. And so you know what we become? We become spiritual teenagers. And if you're a teenager in here, I'm not trying to slap you in the face right now. We've all been teenagers at one point or another, and there's something great about your teenage years. Um, But here's what I realize about a lot of teenagers, not all teenagers. Like I've got a one-year-old son, Jake, right now, and Jake cannot fathom a life where he's not desperately dependent upon my wife and I to provide everything he needs to live. Like when he's hungry, he lets us know. When he's hurting, he wants to be picked up. He cannot fathom a life where we aren't providing for him. But I know one day is gonna come where he's gonna become a teenager. When, he's, when he becomes a teenager, he's gonna demand his independence. Mom and dad, why don't you just leave me alone? Why don't you let me do my thing? I just, let me be in charge. Let me do my thing. Yeah, but by the way, I wanna make sure, you know, I do wanna eat the food that you put on the table for me. <laughs> would you just get off my, would you just get off my back and let me, let me figure life out on my own? Yeah, by the way, please keep making those payments for health insurance because there's gonna be times where I do things that I really can't do and it's gonna cost me a trip to the ER. But mom and dad, seriously, enough is enough. Just let me do my thing. Like I am old enough and I'm strong enough to do my, but I plead, I, I do need to drive the car you bought for me with the gas that you pay for. <laughs> and that's how we become as Christians. That's, that's how we can act. You know what, God? I don't have time for you. I don't know if you see what I have going on in my life right now and how busy I am. I don't have time with you for you right now because I am an ambitious person. Yeah, but uh, God, by the way, I, I am going to need the oxygen that you consistently put into my lungs. But God, let me do my thing. I don't know what is happening right now. <laughs> That's what we want. God, let me do my dreams. Why don't you bless my dreams? Do you not see how high capacity I am right now? Yeah, by the way, God, I do need the brain that you gave me with, with the creativity and the strategery and the high capacity-ness that you have graciously given to me. We have to realize that there is only one God and we are not him. And that's where our lives fall into rhythm. When we find ourselves in the groove of God's will is when we come to a place where we realize that not only can we not be God, but we are desperate without him. The last lie that we tend to believe is simply this, there are no consequences. There are no consequences. What does Satan say to Eve in verse four? It's very simple. He says, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. God told you you will die, but you won't. One source put it this way, the devil presents a suicidal plunge as a leap into life. There are always consequences for rebellion against God. And you know where our enemy is really successful? Our enemy can be really successful when he, when he wins at getting us to, to stop looking at the backside of sin. You realize that there is always a backside to sin. And the enemy is effective when he can kind of veil us to the backside of our sin. If you spend money you don't have, collectors will call. There are consequences. If you gossip, you will lose people's trust. Relationships will 
be broken. If you give yourself over to gluttony, health issues will come. If you are unfaithful in your marriage, it will wreak havoc on your marriage and on your parenting. If you look to things to pacify whatever's going on in your life, whether it's alcohol or prescription pills or pornography, it will feel good in the moment and on the backside of your sin will be something called addiction where you want to break free but can't. Something that promises life will actually steal from you. There are always consequences to sin. And we see that for Adam and Eve. They lost, uh, I, I think that the best way to summarize the consequences that came about from their sin was there was really a complete loss of peace for Adam and Eve. There was a loss of peace with themselves. You think about it, it says in Genesis 3, 7 that they were naked. Or um, they were, uh, that they had, they were naked and not ashamed in the garden. And then what do we see them doing in verse 7? We see them covering themselves up. Because now guilt and shame was a part of the human experience. There was a loss of innocence. You look at verses 9 and 10 in Genesis, I don't have time to read them now, but they went and they hid from God. Why? Because fear had entered the picture. That was the first time that fear was ever experienced, and now it became a normal part of human experience. They lost peace with themselves. They lost peace with one another. Eve shares the fruit with Adam, and then when God comes calling, who does he come to? He comes to Adam, not to Eve, but to Adam. And what does Adam say? This woman that you gave me. Like, I didn't ask you to make her for me. But you did. And she gave it to me. And so what do you see? You see tension. You see disruption in intimacy. They lost peace with themselves. They lost peace with others. And they lost peace with God. God walked with them in the garden. And what do we see them doing now? We see them hiding. And then at the end of Genesis chapter 3, what do we see? We see God remove them from the garden. They no longer walk with God by sight. They now walk with him by faith. They lost peace with themselves, with each other, and with God. See, there's always a backside to sin. There are always consequences to sin. One of the best things you can do is start looking at the backside and saying, is this really going to give me life or steal it from me? Is this going to rip me off or set me free? These are the three lies that we tend to believe. God is really not that good. You don't need God because you can be God. And number three, there are no consequences. Now, here's the question that I want to answer that maybe a few of you, you are asking, what does this have to do with Advent? <laughs> like, this is when we start, like, Christmas series. And you're talking about the devil. You kind of took a detour here. <laughs> uh, I don't know that there's a better passage I could have preached on than this to begin Advent. And here's why I say that. Because in the midst of a chapter that is full of rebellion against God, in a chapter where we are introduced to our enemy, we are also introduced to our Savior. And it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It tells us this. God speaks, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman in between your offspring. He's talking, God is talking to Satan right now. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You know what this is? This is called the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first gospel. It's the first picture we get of a baby in a manger. You know what God says? He says, you know what? A day is coming where a baby will show up in a manger the offspring of the woman will come. And he says, you know what? You are going to bruise the heel of that baby. That's what he tells Satan. You think about a, a, a snake biting your ankle and in, uh, putting venom into your body, that can be a deadly blow. And it was. 
Jesus Christ died on a cross. It was a deadly blow that Satan inflicted upon Jesus Christ. But then what does it say? That, that the offspring of the woman will do to the enemy. It says you will bruise his head or you will crush his head. You want to know how you kill a snake? You crush its head. And so what God is saying is that I have, I have, my people have rebelled against me, but I will not forsake them. And a day is coming where I will send a son. A baby will be born, and that baby will grow up to be the king of kings and lord of lords. You want to know if God's truly good? You look at the baby in a manger. Because when we look at that baby in a manger, you know what we're reminded of? We're reminded of God not needing us, but wanting us and coming for us. That God left heaven and came to earth to rescue us to himself. You know, you want to be reminded of the fact that not only are you not God, but you're, you're hopeless without him. You look at the baby in a manger because what was the trajectory of that baby's life? Well, that baby grew up to live a perfect life. And then after 33 years, that baby was Jesus Christ who was crucified between criminals, but bore the weight of the wrath of God as he endured the wrath of God for your sin and for mine. And then he walked out of a tomb victoriously. You want to know that your sin always has consequences? You look at that baby in a manger. Because your sin promised separation from God for all of eternity. You couldn't get to God because of your sin. So you know what God did? God came to you and to me. And Jesus Christ has come. He was born. He lived. He died. He rose so that we could be brought back to God. You know what the good news is? When I look at this passage, you know what I see? I see the reality that our enemy has an enemy, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he is, he is our king. He is our king. And so I'll just close by saying this. What's the point of this sermon today? Well, it's you have an enemy, and he's seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the best ways he does that is by whispering lies into your life. So you know what the best thing you can do this week is get really well acquainted with the embodiment of truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Know the truth, study his word, seek Jesus. Why? Because Jesus tells us you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come this morning to recognize that we do in fact have an enemy, but we don't leave here fearful of our enemy because we realize that our enemy has an enemy. And so we don't leave here full of fear, we leave here full of confidence, knowing our king. Knowing you, Jesus, as the truth, the embodiment of truth. Lord, thank you that we don't have to believe the lies that people have believed for thousands of years. Thank you that we can walk in the truth, we can know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Because you, Jesus, have come and made God known to us, Lord God. We need you, Lord. As we step onto a battlefield every single day, Lord, would you, God, be near to us. Remind us of your goodness. Remind us of our need for you, God. Help us to look at the backside of sin. And may we walk in the reality that you have not come to rip us off. You've come to set us free. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at Faith Bridge, and I'm sitting here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a sermon called The Devil Wears Deception. So we have a couple questions in. Uh, the first one, um, talking a little bit about, it says that uh, you said that the snake told half-truths, but then he straight up lied uh, when uh, he said that if you would eat the fruit, you would die, but he didn't die right away. And so could you kind of explain that a little bit? Um, yeah, well, um, you know, I think the important thing is to understand what is death. And essentially, death is separation. Mm -hmm. And the Bible speaks to different types of death. There's physical death, there's spiritual death. But death, at its most basic definition, is simply separation. If you're talking about physical death, you're talking about the soul separating from the body. If you're talking about spiritual death, you're talking about uh, separation from right. from the goodness of God. And uh, both of those things took place for Adam and Eve. Um, they experienced they experienced physical death when right. uh, when God made Adam and Eve. We are honestly left to assume that that they would live forever. Mm -hmm. if they walked in obedience mm -hmm. to God. Death doesn't show up until God kills an animal mm -hmm. and clothes them at the end of Genesis chapter 3. But when Adam and Eve uh, sin, one of the reasons God removed them from the garden mm -hmm. is so that they would actually experience the cons consequence of physical death and not live forever in a broken and fallen state. So right. they, they did, in fact, experience physical death mm -hmm. and then they it, they tasted spiritual death right. in the sense that they were made to walk with God mm -hmm. by sight and when God removed them from the garden there was a separation that took place which mm -hmm. was tasting an aspect of that spiritual death mm -hmm. and so I think you can look and say they technically didn't die uh, and at the same time, you can look and say a death had to take place. Right. One of the reasons they were able to keep f living physically for a period of time is because God killed an animal right. and clothed them, showing that blood is always the consequence for, for sin. A mm. death always has to take place. So when I look at it, I look and say, no, death, he did lie. Right. That Ultimately, the lie was that there is no consequence, mm -hmm. that death wouldn't take place or there would be no consequence. But death was honestly a, a huge part of the equation for Adam and Eve when they experienced physical death and then they tasted spiritual right. death. And then another physical death had to take place in order for Adam and Eve to keep living right. physically. Right, that's so good to kind of understand a little bit more of like what even is the death yep. that it's talking about, that separation yep. immediately yep. happened. Um, that's so good. Yeah. Well, we have one other question, and it's just kind of asking, could you explain a little bit more? You said that uh, the devil doesn't want us to be agnostic or atheist. He's fine with us being religious. Could you just speak a little bit more into yeah. that? Well, I'm sure that the devil would love for you to be an agnostic or an <laughs> right. atheist. I would, I'm sure he loves that. Mm -hmm. My point is that that's not his... That's not the only win for him. Right. It, a successful day for the enemy is not just you saying, I don't believe in God anymore. What If you look at the percentage of atheists in the world compared to the amount of people are in the world, the number of atheists is a very, very small minority. Where can the devil be most effective? It's when people who call themselves Christians don't mm. live as Christians. So if Christians live as functional atheists, meaning mm -hmm. they be, they say, I believe in God, but they live as if right. there's no God. Well, what kind of testimony is that to the world? It's not a very good one. Yeah. And that's a really successful day for the enemy. So my point is, what's a, what's, what's a win? Well, if, if we can come to church and leave uninterested mm -hmm. and unmoved, because we believe lies. I mean, mm -hmm. so the enemy can be successful. Success for him can it's not can just take many different forms. Or of course, yeah. Where kind of we that's right. will kind of see that as like that's the ultimate of success. But the enemy's strategic yeah. in trying to just 
pull us away from God. Entirely. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, sweet. Thank you so much, uh, TA, for a, a wonderful and helpful sermon. And thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you back next week uh, for the continuation of Advent. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.